Hello everyone and welcome to today's SANS webcast. A glimpse into new 4500 Windows Forensics course, Windows 10 and beyond. What is your digital forensics investigation missing? My name is Carol Auth of the SANS Institute and I will be moderating today's webcast. Today's featured speaker is Rob Lee, curriculum lead and author for digital forensic and incident response at the SANS Institute. If during the webcast you have any questions for Rob, please enter them into the questions window located on the GoToWebinar interface at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to hand the webcast over to Rob. Hi everyone, uh, my name is uh, Rob Lee and uh, I'm going to be uh, with you today uh, talking about uh, some brand new updates uh, to the Windows Forensics class, uh, Forensics 500. Uh, that's a, a picture of me uh, teaching. I just want to, you know, if you've never uh, seen me before, you know, there I am. I've been doing forensics for about uh, 20 years. Uh, you know, been uh, really fortunate to, uh, to have worked in uh, law enforcement, worked uh, through the Air Force Office of Special Investigations, worked in the federal government, uh, worked uh, as a cyber investigator, on uh, computer intrusion analysis cases uh, with Mandiant uh, for many years. And uh, I've also been uh, an author and teacher for SANS uh, since uh, the year 2000. And uh, I have my own company, uh, Harb Harbingers, uh, based out of Boston, Massachusetts. And uh, I do uh, incident response, uh, digital forensics, uh, and a bunch of incident response policy work uh, for a, a variety of uh, groups that are out there. Uh, but today I really wanted to touch on uh, the latest updates to um, uh, forensics 500, which is our core Windows forensic analysis course. Now, you know, I just want to get start off because a lot of a lot of folks out there are familiar with 408, and you, you're probably wondering why did we renumber the class? Is it a brand new class? What's going on? Well, essentially, it's it's the same course, but the reason why we decided to do the renumbering uh, is primarily is that the the course really doesn't focus on any of the introductory introductory or basics uh, to digital forensics investigations. It really is a core intermediate, uh, to almost in some cases advanced Windows operating system artifact and analysis course. So it, it, as a part of that, over the years that we found a lot of people were talking to me and my co-authors and other instructors saying that uh, they're uh, management and others that are out there saw a four-level course as uh, more of introduction and they've already uh, paid for a lot of people going through introductory material before. So we really don't cover you know, disk imaging or custody or any of the, the core basic ideas of digital forensic investigations. We really hit the ground running in uh, Forensics 500 specifically targeting the artifacts that are found on a Windows system and we really are pushing the edge on keeping our course up to date. And part of the reason why the number changed now is that with the latest update that came out uh, this summer, we have added a bunch of new material and exercises uh, to the class that arguably that this thing is now clearly an intermediate five-level class uh, in the same in the SANS Institute, and it's uh, comparable to a lot of other five-level classes that we also teach at SANS. So, you know, for those who are trying to say, well, you know, how much has changed over the years and what is this going to mean for me? Well, you know, that's one of the reasons why you know, we're, you know, attempting to, you know, go through this on the webcast with you and talk about some of the main differences. So the main change is more of cosmetic. Uh, as the core part of the course has actually rapidly uh, undergone a change over the past three years, for anyone who doesn't know, SANS and my author team are consistently updating our course material for these courses uh, at least twice per year. And you know, with Windows uh, releasing a new operating system at least once per year, and for those who are you know, just say, wait a minute, Windows 10 has been out for a couple of years now, that's true, but there, there have been already four versions of Windows 10 that have been released. And you know, every version of the Windows 10 might introduce additional art, new artifacts and uh, other new items. Uh, the browsers uh, that you're gonna find on a Windows operating system are all, also updating frequently, if not every six weeks, uh, they're updating at least uh, every six months, and a browser is almost its own operating system in of itself. So 
why does it change so frequently? As I mentioned before, uh, part of the reason why is that, you know, even though that there may be a new Windows release, Windows 10 has, you know, a bunch of major releases that are out there, there's a plethora of new forensic artifacts that are being discovered and analyzed. In addition to that, we have a quite an amazing array of new tools and capabilities that are being introduced into uh, the digital forensic space, especially as it relates to uh, Windows analysis uh, that's out there. And then finally, one of the more important ones is as we progress over the years, we need to continually updating our uh, exercises and our data sets for the exercises. And one of the major updates we just released in this past update is a brand new Windows 10 uh, new data set exercise that is um, uh, kind of part hacking case, part insider theft, uh, type, uh, you know, a case. So we really need to make sure that when we're updating our courses that everything is, you walk into that course and you really feel like, wow, this stuff was just released, you know, three or four weeks ago. I can't believe they're already teaching it in the course. And, you know, part of that, you know, also goes back into, hey, you know, this course is tied to a certification, uh, which is ANSI credited. And uh, the GIAC folks, um, which is the uh, certification arm at, at SANS, uh, will tell you if you ever ask them and say, well, you know, which course gives you the biggest headaches? And uh, honestly, a lot of the digital forensics courses do because what we end up having out there is unlike a, you know, a science that is uh, not changing that much, from smartphone forensics to Mac to Windows, every single operating system version is changing so frequently and so often that what was true a year ago may not be true today. So the certification constantly has to keep up to date with us too. So, you know, as a part of that, you know, uh, the GCFE, if you've taken it two years ago, the GCFE today is a probably an entirely new test uh, that they're uh, working off of. So if you ended up uh, worried about, hey, you know, if I have the GCFE certification right now and I'm worried about like, what does the name change uh, is that going to affect me at all? What's going to happen with that? It doesn't. If you notice that here's the logo uh, for the GCFE, you don't see the course number on it. It's the same certification. It is just basically uh, the course that is tied to it is Forensics 500 now. Uh, even your uh, certificate plaque that you have hanging on your wall, hopefully, uh, doesn't also reflect any of the course number of course changes. Uh, it basically reflects that, hey, you're an official uh, GX certified forensic examiner, uh, the GCFE. Certification. So, uh, for anyone out there, you know the DoD 8570 or anyone else that has the GCFE certification that is wrapped into your personnel training requirements, the nothing has changed on the certification front except the certification itself has to maintain currency with what we're teaching in the course, and that's why GIAC will probably be the first to tell you it's like, ah, yeah, those forensics folks, they keep us challenged, uh, you know, they keep us uh, frosty on our toes while we're uh, trying to do all these updates. So uh, another question we routinely get is, well, how does this affect between uh, prior, formerly 408 and 508? Well, between the two courses here, and you know, we kind of some of the bullets here, that 500 is primarily on a deep dive forensic analysis of Windows operating systems, whereas 508 is an advanced incident response and threat hunting course that is also based off of Windows platforms, but we start increasing from just analyzing a single platform to multiple platforms across the enterprise environment. The, uh, the key here is that there's very little overlap between both courses. Uh, there's a couple of artifacts that are reviewed and some artifacts that are gone uh, more in depth between both courses, but you know, the original theory between that we would recommend taking the Windows Forensics course prior to 508 is still true, though at this point we have had people take these classes out of order. Uh, you know, it's another way to say, you know, which should you read first, Lord of the Rings or The Hobbit? You know, of course, you'll have the purists out there say, well, tell, you know, we, I would recommend read The Hobbit first and then read Lord of the Rings, but everyone knows that the stories are really independent and in order to get the full picture, you need both, but you could actually take them in any order. So our recommendation is if you are able to take both classes and you have the ability to do so, we do recommend Windows Forensics 500 prior to 508. But if you say, hey, I need an advanced IR skills and capabilities, I've actually seen a lot of folks take 508 and then go back and complete the deep dive Windows Forensic Analysis training that you have uh, from 500.
uh, that's out there. So we really have gotten to the point now that you can take the classes in any order as your needs arise, and they still are really tied together as brother and sister courses as they still focus on the same pla uh, the same platforms. But one focuses on the deep dive analysis for forensics, uh, you know, system artifact locations, and uh, the next focus are more on intrusion analysis, enterprise, multi-system multi uh, investigations. And there's almost 5% overlap between both both of the classes. You know, for example, we review peer prefetch again in both classes because it's needed. You know, and it's you know for those who have taken both classes, you'll be uh, really happy uh, that you've done so. Um, so if you're a 408 alum and you would say, hey, listen, you know, as I'm going to go through 408, you know, what and 500, what has changed in the class here in the next few slides? If you're interested in taking the class again. Uh, and this is, again, for any SANS class, for anyone who didn't know this, if you've taken a SANS class, it's been six years, and you know, hey, they update this thing two to three times a year, that it's probably a brand new course at this point, and you wanted to come back and take it one more time, well, there is a, a standard alumni discount of if you've taken the class in the past, you need to obviously call or email SANS registration and you know, give them your SANS account information. They'll look you up, and then they'll apply a 50% discount if you want to retake. Uh, the course at some point in the, uh, in the future. And we've actually had a lot of people do this. You, you kind of say, well, how often does things change? It's honestly between uh, four years ago and today, it's a brand new course. Um, you know, almost 80% of the material has probably been rewritten, updated, because, you know, four or five years ago, we're only focusing on Windows XP and Windows 7. Today, we're primarily focusing on Windows 10, Windows 8, and Windows 7 a little bit, uh, you know, for our class. So let's talk about beyond just say, the name change, which is a lot of people are saying, why did you change the name? Uh, let's talk about what this class entails and what it really target is, uh, targets uh, as a part of what we're looking for here. Uh, so for the first thing, you know, I always you know, really try to talk about this, but is the who does Windows for the analysis? Who would actually be the best people to take a class like this? And across the board here, we have three different groups. So I, I kind of label them as the bad guy suppression units, the cybersecurity groups, and then obviously the legal community. The bad guy suppression units, uh, these are the law enforcement and the military. And you know, in both instances, you have a group of individuals out there that are basically tasked with stopping bad guys. And obviously with bad guy suppression, the, the, the law enforcement agents, the local and federal, are trying to take down organized crime groups, they're trying to take down uh, people using computers uh, for child exploitation, they're trying to take down anyone that is a potentially a bad guy using a computer. Now obviously that's gonna tie into the legal community as they move to prosecution, but you really never see someone in law enforcement ever call themselves, hey, I'm a, a legal community support because you know everything has to get, you go through prosecution. They're in really, in their mindset is like, we take down bad guys, and whether it goes to prosecution or not is their hope. But again, their task in doing their jobs is uh, predicated on proper analysis of any of the media, whether a Mac, Windows, smartphone, of any media that's presented to them so they could pull the relevant data off, write up their case, and present it to the prosecutor, and hopefully the prosecutor will take up the case and move to prosecution. On the opposite side, you have the military. Now, the military, obviously, on the cybersecurity side is you know charged with defending cyber networks, but the military also has a huge play in what we call, uh, not us, but you know the org, uh, groups out there in, in the industry called media exploitation, which is you know recovering cell phones, laptops, hard drives from terrorists and adversaries in the field. And when they are able to extract the data from these devices, then they're able to gain intelligence value from them and potentially then put steel on target or potentially use that for monitoring drones over flights or anything like that as they're trying to learn more about the adversary or find out who they're communicating with and, and, and so forth. So the military also has a large group of individuals and also you know intelligence agencies as well that are very interested in, uh, well, not prosecuting someone, but they're still doing bad guy suppression uh, and you can read into that as you will, uh, as to trying to take down people that they feel are threats to uh, their country. Um, and the biggest swath that's out there is the cybersecurity side, which is, you know, SANS is a cybersecurity training organization. And primarily, a lot of people use forensic analysis for both internal and external cases. Internal, you have the Edward Snowdens, you have the people stealing data from your organization, uh, trying to exfiltrate it via the network, trying to exfiltrate it via USB devices, trying to, you know, and how do they get access to it? How do you create that trail? 
Uh, so you have the internal threats that are part of that. Cybersecurity is about that. You also have the external threats. These are the hacker groups, the organized crime. You have the advanced persistent threat groups that are out there. Um, and again, in doing investigations, trying to track what an adversary is doing inside your network, it, at some point will require deep dive forensic analysis of your systems. And you know, if you think that there's really a difference between an insider uh, being able to steal data from you and an outsider doing that, is that it's actually more difficult to investigate the insider because there are a known quantity and they actually do not need to traverse the network in order to get access to the data that they seek. They literally could go up to the computer system, plug in a device, and exfiltrate it directly without having to traverse the network, whereas an outsider has to traverse the network to get access to said data. But you know what they do on keyboard on that system is almost identical. What they're looking for, how did they find it, what are they doing, what tools they're using, what anti-forensics techniques they're using, and again, it all wraps into you know, that threat profile that we're all trying to build here by doing proper forensic analysis. And then finally is the legal community. And this one is when people think of digital forensics, this is where you primarily think of things uh, in, the, in the world is because, you know, it's sensationalized by the movies and television shows, CSI, Law and Order and whatnot, is that, you know, when things get to a point where you need, either need to go to civil or criminal proceedings, uh, then, you know, the standard bearer for, you know, producing uh, proper reports, fact-based evidence, uh, into the courtroom is that last nugget that's there. So it really brings in the, you know, the trilogy of groups that are out there that are really interested in uh, doing forensic analysis on a Windows system. So you know, how does this tie into the class? Well, we really approach uh, Windows Frank analysis not just from, hey, we're only teaching law enforcement. We're teaching it from, hey, there may be bad guy suppression units, media, uh, military, uh, doing media exploitation. We might have folks in there doing cybersecurity trying to investigate an Edward Snowden inside their organization. They may be using Windows Forensics to be able to investigate advanced persistent threats from China or Russia, uh, you know, hitting a system and trying to figure out what they took off with. So it's kind of a, even though we just talked about the different groups, we still approach it from an agnostic perspective in trying to say what are all these groups going to be interested in. And as a result, instead of just talking about, you know, different artifacts, we try to categorize the artifacts into different areas, such as how do you prove someone executed a tool? How do you prove someone opened a file? How do you know someone downloaded or exfiltrated something from the system, either via a USB device or via the network? How can we even prove that they knew about the location of a file, even though that you can't prove that they opened it? All of these different account uh, evidence of categories are really what the Windows Forensics uh, 500 class is all about. And so we are very agnostic in saying it doesn't really matter the case that you're using, is questions, what is the question you're trying to solve? And we've created a poster that you see linked here that is really the center of our class here, Forensics 500, which you'll see a different category for each segment of the poster, which we'll talk about, you know, uh, user assist or the app compact cache or the last visit to RMRUs, and basically tells you where the artifact is, the description of the artifact, where to potentially, how to examine it, and so forth. Now, obviously, in the class, we're going to show you different tools to use. We're going to show you the different exercises to use for this. But, you know, the key part of the course that we're trying to really emphasize here is that, you know, if you're trying to be able to prove if someone is going through different folders using Windows Explorer, you're going to look at the shell bags. And so this poster basically is able to prove different locations that someone is able to show if they're trying to say, how do we know that they opened up that file? How would we be able to show that? How would we be able to show that they executed a uh, uh, S-Delete, which is a file deletion program to do file wiping, we would be able to show it through different interactions with the poster. And so the poster becomes a massive cheat sheet of all the forensic artifacts that are out there. And it all honestly becomes the cornerstone of our course because people now literally have this thing up in their office environments after they leave the course and they're saying, man, you know, I need a reminder of all of these artifacts because there's so many and it's impossible for everyone to remember each one. So we've created the poster for free for people to you know, put out there and, and basically use this poster as, uh, as during their investigations. The other thing that is really uh, centered on our class now at this point is that we're really focusing on Windows 10 Forensics and, and Ford at this point. Almost the entire class is uh, really gunning down that street of you know, if it's a Windows 10 artifact, then it's gonna remain in the course. If it's Windows 7 or Windows XP, you know, definitely Windows XP is, 
if there's an artifact that has Windows XP all the way through Windows 10, we'll mention, hey, it's also on Windows XP, but we're really focusing on the latest Windows operating systems. Um, we, uh, we know that a lot of people strolling on, are still on Windows 7, and we use that as more of a legacy example like we used to do with XP, but we're primarily trying to drive uh, the train forward on the entire course, you know, focusing on Windows 10 and beyond, so especially since Windows 10 has been, been out for multiple years now. Um, and of course, you know, Windows 7, Windows 8.1, and all the server variations that are out there as well, most of the artifacts have a unique overlap, and as a result, we're going to talk about where overlap does exist and which things are going to be unique between different operating systems that are out there. The other thing that we really emphasize in our class is we have an overall uh, case data set that we're working on throughout the entire course, and we have fairly new uh, data sets as, out there as well, so you could potentially see any of the differences between the different Windows operating systems, such as Windows 10, Windows 8.1, Windows 7, and it's really key to understand is that the exercises that you go through in the class are the key to learning, and we have an workbook that is over 400 pages long that has a full step-by-step -step for every single tool or technique that's out here. And here's just a couple screen captures from different sections in the workbook that basically step someone through the different techniques and tools that you could use to potentially uh, target doing proper Windows forensic analysis, targeting those artifacts. Now, you know, as we mentioned here, it's like obviously you're going to need some tools that we're going to be uh, potentially be working with throughout this course. That is true, but the tool, the, the tool and teaching you the tool is not the focus of the course. It, in fact, I, if someone really says, what is this course about? I said, well, it's really about the poster. It's about really using your knowledge of the artifacts to be able to uh, get answers from your uh, data sets that, are, that you're using for your evidence. And as a result of that, you know, it doesn't matter the tool that you use in order to be able to get that data out. It should be primarily focused in on, you know, you could use any tool. They All the tools out there should produce the same results. And I've put air quotes in around should because we all know that's not true. Um, and so as a result of that, we do expose students to both uh, free and open source capabilities and commercial. And at this point, you can actually use a combination of both, and we do recommend that. But in most of our exercises, we do tend to have a flavor of either, you know, here's a commercial tool that does it, you know, such as, you know, from something from TZ Works or Magnet Forensics. On the other side, we will potentially show you a free tool, such as Eric Zimmerman's Registry Explorer uh, or other capabilities uh, that are out there. Um, and so it really becomes a very important thing to note is that we're not teaching to a tool, but we obviously have to use tools to be able to do demonstration of the different artifacts. And even though we say you know, we're not tool focused, a lot of people you know, get an idea of, hey, these tools really work. We don't like teaching tools that don't work. So everything that we teach in the class, it really is a best of breed capability that is out there and or it's been recommended to us. But we also know that there's some groups out there that says, hey, listen, we are required to use commercial tools because we need the vendor support. We need to be able to have them on contract for our software as a service type capabilities or any other things that might be out there. Government agencies are a good example of this, and we can't you know, uh, credit our free and open source side. So, and that's one of the reasons we actually teach both. The other thing that comes into play, and I always see, hear this in class is, uh, well, don't you need to only teach a quote unquote accredited tools, you know, things that are only forensically sound or courtroom approved. Well, first of all, there's no such thing as a courtroom approved tool, despite what the vendors might tell you. They're basically saying that our tool has been used in the courts and no one objected to it, you know, uh, as a result of it. But again, as if you're able to articulate what the tool is doing behind the scenes, which is what we really emphasize in the course, then you really can use any capability that's out there. And I do recommend because things change so rapidly that it, if it's a key smoking gun evidence, you probably want to reanalyze it using a second option, a second tool, a second set of eyes on the evidence in order to make sure everything is you know, square when you're going to be writing that in report. But we also have way too many examples out there where a single tool produces a bad uh, output and that is to totally throws off the case. You know, Casey Anthony is a good example of that and others, is that you potentially need to make sure that you're doing your own tool validation. So we like to have a variety of different capabilities that people end up using in the class. So let's now talk about and shift into, you know, what are some of the new focus areas in the, the Windows Forensics class? And this is, you know, I went through this morning, um, you, know, as, you know, it's really hard for me to do this because there's so many things that I find 
extremely fascinating and extremely fun for people to be able to see of what's relevant and what is new in the course. And we only have a limited amount of time here. So, you know, I, I went through and really tried to say, what, what are some of the key things that someone who hasn't taken the course in a while to really have their eyes open and saying, wow, there's, you know, some serious, really interesting areas in here that we're, we're really trying to do. So one of the first ones is, um, and I like talking about this on day one in the class, is that Windows and Macs and smartphones and all these other devices are now all talking to one another. And this is a really interesting thing. You, it, it's almost impossible now to have a stovepiped uh, system that doesn't talk to any other system that you have. You know, most of you out there that are listening in on this webcast at this point, I could probably, you know, point to at least three devices within arm's reach of you that have data synchronization going on. And what I mean by data synchronization at its core is, you know, for example, if you're on your iPhone or your Windows phone uh, or Android and you read an email there and it shows that you read it and you now switch over to your laptop, your Mac or your Windows PC, and you go into that uh, same location in email, will it show that email that you just read is currently read or unread? And we all know the answer to that question is the email is one of the first things that did data synchronization where you potentially have a single location that you're all looking at all through these different devices. And if you show you read a single email, it's gonna show as read on all of your devices simultaneously at that point. Now this is expanded, uh, you know, people, you know, beyond email, we're talking about calendars, we're talking about now your desktop systems, your browser data and more are all synchronizing across multiple devices. Um, and if, a lot of people may not have more than one Windows system, but if you did and you logged in using a Microsoft portal account, which they really are emphasizing you doing uh, at this point, so you have a single log on through Microsoft portal that you log into two different desktops on you'll notice immediately that data synchronization is occurring behind the scenes without you wanting it to or not. Uh, your desktop background will change, your desktop icons. Uh, you know, recently opened files are gonna be copied over between both systems. Uh, there's a massive amount of data synchronization that is now occurring between your browser data. As soon as you log into a Windows device uh, using your Windows portal account, uh, data synchronization is going on for the Internet Explorer and Edge browsers. Um, again, whether you like it or not. Um, it, you could turn a lot of the stuff off, but by default, the average individual doesn't know that this is occurring uh, behind the scenes. Another good example that you see here on the smartphone is you see that little Skype application that's in there. Has anyone been on Skype on multiple systems? You'll know this to be true. If you're Skyping in a window on your smartphone, that history is also being synchronized to your laptop or any other system that you've ever logged into using the same Skype account. And you sit there and your head starts to explode because you start to say, well, how do we know they did it on this device? So one of the things that we're really trying to you know, talk about is that in the class, in 500, we're now starting to really have to recognize which of the applications that we're forensicating have synchronized data from uh, application A on device A to application A, same application on device B. And how do we know which device was used to originate that data? And what happens in case that that data is then deleted on one of the devices? Is it deleted, a uh, forced delete happens across all these devices? And you, know, you could kind of see where I'm leaning here. The answer obviously would be, no, otherwise it'd be a really poor discussion point. Uh, but you know, browser forensics is a really good example of that where if you delete your history on a single device, it doesn't synchronize the deletion uh, on and other devices. It, that history is potentially still sitting on another device and you might still have access to that device. So you know, every single time you log into a computer system now, data synchronization is a big issue. So in 500, we're really starting to focus in on this data synchronization across multiple devices. Obviously we're focusing on the Windows side and a lot of it has to deal with browser data, uh, especially because a lot of cases are contingent on browser, but it's not just that, you know, USB devices that are plugged into multiple systems, you know, what does the forensic residue for those and more uh, that we'd be, potentially be able to see. All right, uh, here's another really cool capability that we just completely rewritten our entire registry day uh, to account for. Uh, but one of our SANS instructors, Eric Zimmerman, has probably written the most badass and cutting edge free registry examination tool that's currently existing out there in the market. I uh, have not seen anything that comes close to this capability at this point. 
Um, and the really great thing about it is, is that it basically incorporates a lot of the features a lot of the other tools have had. Um, and you know, the only other argument I would have out there of a tool that might come close to this is the Arsenal, Arsenal Recon's um, uh, registry recon capability that's out there that does a significant uh, registry examination as well. Uh, so if you're going to compare between the two and says, Rob, which two registry tools would you use? It'd be Registry Explorer and Registry Recon. But, you know, I'm not pushing, they didn't tell me to, hey, mention my arsenals or anything like that. But it's like one of these things that we tried to talk about in the class, which is what do people actually use? Uh, in Registry Explorer for, you know, we used to use Registry Viewer from Access Data and just wasn't kept up to date. It would crash all the time. Um, it didn't have as many plugins. We'd have to use Registry Viewer uh, Plus, Red Tripper. And Red Dripper had some plugins, you know, that, you know, they do their best, you know, to keep those things up to date. Uh, but again, nothing, you know, kind of came to the capabilities of what Registry Explorer is able to do for folks at this point. And so as you're seeing here, it's like, wow, that looks like a standard Registry Viewer. What else does it do? Um, so one of the things that it does, I'm trying to go to the next slide here. Oh, available bookmarks is where I want to be. Yeah, here you go. So one of the things you're able to do, once you load in a Registry High file, uh, you switch over to, if you look at the upper left-hand corner here, where the arrow is pointed right here, or my uh, arrows on the slide right now, is you'll see this tab called Available Bookmarks. And what Eric has done is basically every key that contains significant forensic data, they're automatically bookmarked for you. So you could actually just use the full high view and browse to it, or you could go to bookmark view, and it's a shortcut to these locations. And once you're in these locations, you'll see the, the value, which the decoded output. Uh, in this example here, we're looking at recent docs where it automatically decodes all of the information from recent docs when it was first opened, when it was last opened, uh, and more uh, based on what we currently know about doing proper forensics against uh, these document, uh, the recent docs that are in the registry. It also has the overall key overview down here and obviously the hex uh, data down here, but you can see all the different available bookmarks. There's hundreds of them that Eric has done a really decent job. And if you find one that is not listed as a bookmark, I guarantee if you email Eric uh, and say, hey, listen, this is missing, he'll have it updated in the tool within a week. Um, you know, he's really um, almost uh, obsessively, uh, uh, you know, compulsive about making sure his tool has everything it could do built into it. So it's what, he's one of those individuals that is very friendly and you know is very appreciative to any ideas that you potentially send over to them uh, when you're using a tool such as this. The other thing that I found is extremely useful in here, which I've not seen a lot of other registry capabilities that are out there, is uh, the ability to do registry keyword searching. Now, so say you have you know hey, there's a keyword or you know dirty word list that you're using, and you're not sure if it exists in a key anywhere in there, or potentially that you want to search for a uh, keyword between a certain date and timestamp, you could obviously do that as well. And it basically will show every single location inside uh, the registry for doing that keyword searching. Uh, you could do regular expression searching. You could look at the key name, the value name, the, uh, the value Slack, the value data, and more through here. The other thing that I don't have a good screenshot for, but I'd like to mention it, for those of you who are doing APT cases, uh, the Registry Explorer actually has a built-in capability to identify an, uh, any key values that have a very large uh, data as a part of it. We all know at this point that a lot of advanced persistent threats are embedding inside these tools uh, capabilities uh, to you know, do file list malware. They'll potentially have a PowerShell script that's something that's obfuscated. And the tool will do a decent job saying, hey, there's some abnormally large uh, values that you should probably go take a look at. And it'll, you'll do that. It also has built-in decoders if you want to do uh, B64 decoding and other things like that. It also does those. And you know we're barely scratching the surface of what the tool is able to do. So there's your keywords, there's your date last time, your descriptions, and your search output. The other thing that this tool does, uh, which is extremely valuable, uh, other tools do this as well, um, commercial tools. Uh, but this is the only free tool I know out there that does this extremely well via GUI which is ex exposing uh, deleted keys uh, in their values that are in there. Notice what we end up having here is in the recent docs, you end up having a bunch of deleted keys with a red X over it. It's still able to extract out the data from these deleted keys. So it's another good example of that while we're going through it. Another uh, tool that's out there that we also teach in the class now, also written by Eric Zimmerman, and it, you know, Eric, this is one of his first tools that he wrote, which is pretty amazing capability. 
uh, which is shell bag, the shell bags explorer. Now, if you're not familiar with shell bags, uh, basically any time that you uh, via Windows Explorer open up a folder, it literally drops a breadcrumb into the registry saying that you open up this folder. So even if it's on an external device, whether it's you're in a control panel, whether you're in a uh, special location within Windows, uh, the shell bags registry locations of the shell items is keeping track of all these different folders that you specifically open and we're able to track them. And that's where, you know, if someone's on an external drive and they're copying things over to that drive, we're able to tell that via Registry Explorer. Even if they didn't open up the, uh, the, the file, they still would potentially need to navigate to the folder where they're potentially placing it to. And we potentially see that via the USB, and that's what we're actually seeing here. In the F drive templates, we're able to see that this was um, a folder that was copied over here. If you actually compare the creation time and modification time, uh, it was created after it was last modified, and as a result of that, this is a signature for a file copy. Um, and that's something that we really emphasize in the class is how do we tell if someone is stealing data from us, whether it's an APT, whether it's an internal, what it, you know, what did they potentially take? And this is, you know, Shellbags Explorer does, you know, really good way to expose a lot of that data behind the scenes as well. So, you know, as we know, the tool is not just based on a bunch of, uh, you know, the class is not based on a bunch of tools that are out there. We also have a bunch of new capabilities that are built within uh, Windows as well. And you really can't go that far uh, without really getting excited about uh, the new SRUM, uh, the system resource utilization monitor that is built within Windows 8.1 and Windows 10 that keeps track of a plethora of internal data that is just waiting for you to extract. Now, the, one of the reasons why that this is a very significant new uh, section for us within uh, our Windows class is that what if someone is using an application such as Skype or a browser to uh, send a lot of data out of the network? Um, and so one of the things that we're able to see here is that we're able to see uh, processes that are run and we're able to target the application and more, but you know, we get energy usage and some other things that are in, inside in here, but we're actually able to see via the network per process that's on a system, Skype or a browser or you know something else, how many bytes were sent, how many bytes were received. So if someone is sending out a lot of data via an application, you obviously see more data that is sent out than the bytes that are obviously received back from uh, the uh, SRUM analysis database uh, that we're going to be uh, you know showing people how to parse. And it's extremely useful for us to be able to identify the process and potentially network activity of a process because that's able to tell us, you know, if someone is potentially exfiltrating data from, uh, from our host using a network, and we're able to tie it down to the specific process that's in there. Even if the process is no longer running, it is recording this data inside uh, the system resource utilization um, uh, monitor that is built within uh, the latest versions of Windows. Every process, as soon as you launch a process, is going to keep be uh, keeping track of this, and it also provides us additional layers of evidence of execution in here as well, which is, again, uh, for anyone who is keeping track of latest APT stuff and more, and they potentially use, uh, you know, putty secure copy or something like that to be able to exfiltrate data, then you might be able to see the user executed the app, how many, uh, how many bytes were sent out. It gives you kind of an estimation of what potentially how much uh, data that they took from the system. And then you marry this data up with what files were potentially opened up around that point in time or which files were recently created, deleted. Uh, and which folders were open, you might have a good idea what potentially was taken from your system and which application was sent over. Uh, so this is, you know, basically a you know, quick overview of some of the things that we're able to do uh, within uh, SRUM analysis. Now, what about other things that are in there? And I pulled this example out is, you know, showing evidence of file opening, kind of tying back to the SRUM, which is, you know, are there changes that happen in Windows 10 that are not found on other versions of the operating system? And we all know that shortcut files, the LNK files, are created automatically when you open up a file on a system. And we they're all a part of a grouping within the course that we call shell item analysis. And with shell item analysis, it, you know, we're able to show usually evidence of file opening, program execution, and more. And as a part of that, we're able to see in the uh, latest change in Windows 10, you know, some of the significant differences that we're able to now see with shortcut files being created. And one of the coolest things that are in here now is that the used to just include the Nokia strategy .lnk, but now it actually includes the uh, .docx, the extension of the file .lnk at the end of it. It also has multiple different. Uh, if you open up a uh, create a folder, it's going to probably create three shortcut files as a result of that. 
uh, you know, as a result, you know, when we're able to tell these differences, it creates the, the created folder, the folder and subfolder uh, for the um, uh, different, uh, the, basically the different parents where it's going to be going back and it's going to be showing that in a shortcut file that we're going to be looking at on the system. Some of the things that are extremely useful to investigations today is again, going back to our Registry Explorer, uh, you know, Office 365 examinations. Uh, we covered this in depth, you know, what uh, residue is left within the Registry of Office 365. And this is really critical, especially as you're having data synchronization. A lot of the most recently opened up files are going to be recorded on any system that you potentially have used that plugs into OneDrive. For example, say on your iPhone all the way down to a browser, all the way back to a laptop. If you open up a file, a lot of the data is synchronized across the different versions of uh, Office 365. And as a result of that, that is being stored in the registry and we're able to see first open, last open time, the full file path and more of uh, where this data uh, was found uh, when it was opened up. So, you know, we really started to touch upon some of the latest capabilities that, you know, people are looking at and saying, hey, Office 365 is, you know, really emphasizing, you know, open up an Office document from anywhere on your phone, on your laptop and, you know, be a browser in, in an internet cafe, you know, go to very similar what Google Docs was trying to do for years and still probably arguably doing it better. But Office 365 is trying to, you know, edge out that competition and, you know, creates a ton of forensic artifacts uh, for us to take a look at here. The other thing that we also uh, really start to emphasize in here is, uh, you know, differences between uh, mass storage devices, which are standard USB keys, and uh, media transfer protocol, which are other devices such as phones and, um, you know, other devices that you're able to actually copy files to and from. And so through on our USB device analysis section that we just don't uh, primarily uh, focus on, uh, a lot of these uh, different capabilities that are out there. But again, if someone plugs in an Android phone, yeah, you could steal data from your network just like you do a USB device, and we need to be able to show how that occurs and where these different artifacts are going to be uh, showing that the file was potentially opened or copied to uh, one of these devices uh, that is really cool for you know opening um, you know doing this type of tracking and we cover all three of the devices the picture transfer protocol the media transfer protocol and the um, mass storage class which is the MSC device and the and all, we you know most people are really interested in USB devices but again we still need to talk about Android phones Windows phones and uh, iPhones and iPhones actually you can't really easily copy files directly to the platform. You have to use iTunes or something like that, but it has its own uh, aspect. But Android, you could actually, you know, shows up as a drive letter, copy files over to it, and much easier. Same thing with Windows phones as well. Um, and we're, you know, basically showing some different capabilities that are out there. Um, email, you know, a lot of people say, well, I know email forensics, but, you know, some of the things you may not know about email is that, uh, you know, within uh, Microsoft uh, messaging architecture, uh, there's these extended mappy headers and a lot of individuals doing digital forensic investigations, you know, are fairly unaware uh, that these things exist. And so we spend, you know, a little bit of the class talking about using a, a commercial tool called Nuix uh, that could expose via the Outlook uh, metadata in a single email message uh, whether or not uh, when uh, an individual actually read an email, whether they forwarded the email, whether they uh, you know, examined, um, you know, potentially re re replied to the email at all. It basically shows all this information, you know, for example, in the PR last verb executed, shows what the individual did uh, on that email, including if they made it unread, it's like made unread is, you know, what the last thing you did to it. Uh, even though, so there's a lot of capabilities in here that, you know, when you're doing email examinations, that, you know, it's not just, hey, I know that, there's a lot of things in here that we get into, including how do we potentially do enterprise-wide email examinations using Outlook and PowerShell to look for any email that has a specific subject with a specific attachment between these date and timestamps that we're able to use a PowerShell script to be able to pull that out of our uh, email. The other thing about email that frustrates a lot of examiners today is that it's not guaranteed other than webmail to exist on the system. You actually still might need to go to that email server and extract out the PSD archive of the individual separately uh, doing that, that acquisition, which again, this is fairly new as, you know, Microsoft has really tried to shift away from storing local PSDs and only using OST files uh, for offline uh, transactions, uh, you know, between yourself and the, uh, the Outlook uh, you know, and the Exchange uh, email servers that are out there. Um, and we also talk about some new artifacts out there, evidence of execution, the uh, AIMCache Hive. It's a brand new Hive file that uh, came out with the Windows 8.1, which exists on Windows 10 and has been retrically activated through uh, Windows uh, 7 now. 
and you're able to say per application, per device, um, you know, your volume, you're able to track, you know, which USB executed the program, which hard drive, and it also is able to tell you the executable name, the SHA-1 hash for the executable, and of course, the you know, first time of execution for the application. And this is just, again, touching on some of the newer artifacts that, you know, we're really trying to get into uh, with the latest versions of Windows uh, that are out there. Um, this is going into a little bit of browser forensics. And, you know, as we get into browser forensics, you know, a lot of people are, you know, saying, hey, browser forensics, I have a tool that does that. But what a lot of people don't know is that, you know, it's been years that it's taken the latest tools to get up to date, be able to parse Windows uh, IE 10 and IE 11 artifacts, which are no longer stored in index.dat files. They're stored in uh, ESC database, extensible storage engine da database, which is its own uh, kind of like journaling database. And these things are not written to immediately. Um, so what's really crazy here that if you're analyzing a computer system and someone's using Internet Explorer to do uh, browsing and you use your tool to analyze the ESC database, it may not contain all the most recent up-to-date information. And so in the class, we really try to point this out. You know, we take a look at the database down here. Uh, it was written to at 10.25 a.m., but if you look at the log file, the log file has not synced to the database yet. And obviously, the log file has been written to after, almost a day after, um, the ESC database. And so when you uh, sync the database, you'll actually notice that there's uh, you know, 32 entries of where they browse to online that are missing, uh, you know, two cookies, about 3,000 cache entries when we do this, did this comparison here. But in order to you know, make sure your tools are hitting this correctly, you actually need to sync the database offline and then have your tool parse that database. Otherwise, if you don't do that, you're likely missing the last 24 hours of data uh, when, uh, for Internet Explorer and Edge. Uh, and this is quite significant. I've actually talked to a lot of law enforcement where their mouths literally drop and they're like, and they start going, uh-oh, when they hear this in the class and we start talking about how do we do this, what are the tools, it's a tool called ESC uh, NTUtil that you could force the synchronization, but obviously you need to copy the data off. You know, you don't answer read only at this point. You need to copy it off, sync it, and then do a comparison between the original and, and new to be able to see how many entries uh, were missing from that. So if you really want the latest up-to-date information, you actually need to force the synchronization. And I've looked at all the tools that are out there, and no tool from my perspective, and, the, and of course I've always asked this question, if you know something, please let me know, because I'm always interested in the learning. Um, does a tool out there automatically detect that it's out of sync, does the synchronization for you and provides you a full picture? Or is the tool kind of blind to it, you know, you know when they're doing this? And most, most tools that I've seen are, are blind to it and rely on the examiner uh, to say, here's our completed ESC database uh, for AI 10.11 or Edge uh, they potentially want to take a look at. In addition to that, you know, another artifact that not a lot of forensic tools out there hit or parse correctly is, and this has been out there for years now, ever since IE8, is the IE session recovery folders. And this is what happens when your browser crashes and says, would you like to restore your last you know, uh, location where you were browsing to? And you say, yes, I would. Uh, these are actually stored in, these, uh, in this folder here under local Microsoft Internet Explorer recovery active. So you have these .dat files. Each one is going to be a separate tab that was opened up in your last browsing sec uh, session. And again, you know, for your automated tools that take a disk image and parse everything, not a lot of tools parse the session recovery stuff. In fact, I, we only teach one tool that we know actually out there does it manually, uh, but not only a lot of the automated tools out there uh, automatically detect these and you know, pull these in and potentially pull the data from these. And one of the reasons why these are very important is this is one of the few artifacts that if you're in in private browsing mode, it is actually going to create and write that tab on disk and it's recoverable. So if you're in in-private browsing mode in Internet Explorer, you can actually see all the different websites and uh, the history of each uh, tab that is in each one of these DAT files, including one that is in in-private browsing mode. Uh, so it's, it's, you know, these are some of the things in browser forensics, you know, beyond the history and cookies and cache that we start talking about that you really get people's eyeballs going saying, hey, what? Another one, uh, especially with IE, is the synchronization. Um, that it, you know, what data is synchronized between a browser on two different systems. Now, I mentioned earlier on the data synchronization, uh, especially in the latest version of 500, uh, we end up starting to touch upon that if you have ever logged into another Windows system using the same Microsoft account, immediately behind the scenes, a lot of data is synchronized between both systems, including, without your permission, your IE history, your favorites, your passwords, your tabs potentially that were opened up, 
Uh, and here's a, just an example in here, what is synced between Windows 8 and Windows 8.1, but even if you open up a tab on a, in, inside your Inner Explorer window, it is gonna synchronize that data onto the second system. And you're, we show you how to potentially detect that DAT file, how to potentially forensicate it, how do we look at it. Uh, and I always tell this to law enforcement, I said, man, you know, this provides another really interesting way to provide monitoring is that if you log in using credentials of a criminal on a second system, uh, you, you potentially approve that second system out there and you can potentially do this behind the scenes somehow. Every time that someone opens up, opens up a browser and starts browsing through Inner Explorer, that data is automatically synchronized to the second system. So it provides a, you know, in built-in monitoring capability if you wanted to do it. Uh, and I played around with this on my own and it definitely works. Um, and so it's really crazy. And for those of you who are saying, well, IE11, you know, well, that's been replaced by Edge. Well, not so. You actually have both IE11 and Edge that are sitting on Windows 10 simultaneously. Uh, and so, you know, uh, you know, how much of this data is synchronized? Now, the really interesting thing is uh, it comes to what data synced, uh, what uh, is going to persist after history is cleared. Um, on your local system, you know, pretty much as you expect, you know, things are removed from the webcast.dat file, but they're still actually coverable because it's a database. Uh, but again, on the remote systems, um, all the history is going to persist. So, you know, even though the history has been synchronized to your remote system, you just cleared history on your local one. You didn't clear it on the other one. You actually have to manually go on, log on to your second system and clear your history on that one. And this gets people like, wait, what? You know, so my history is sitting on another system that I logged into, and as soon as I log back into that system, you know, then I could clear it. I'm like, yep. Um, you know, so again, a lot of things have to happen in order for the synchronization to occur. But, you know, it's like how much is cached in the Microsoft Borg before it's synced to the other system. It's kind of like Google and the other ones. So you say, well, what about Google? Does Google do this stuff too? Uh, the answer is yes, and you could do that. And as we mentioned before, and it's really hard to do this in a very short time frame, but can we identify synced versus local-based, you know, uh, creation of this data? And for Inner Explorer, Chrome, Firefox, the answer to that question is yes. Um, you know, one of the things that we're showing you here in Chrome history is that Chrome history is able to show uh, the source of the uh, website, whether it's a import or whether it's synced or user browse. If the value is zero, it was synced from another a logged in Chrome session. So this is a really good one to play around with on your phones and on your local laptops. Log in via Chrome on your phone, browse to a couple websites, and then go look at your history via your SQLite database examiner. And in that file, you'll see that that was synced from your phone. It shows, you know, sources synced, and you have to go back to your visits in order to identify this. Now, here's the thing that was going to boggle your minds a little bit here. How many of your tools are at this point showing you synced versus not uh, local generated data um, via your tools, from Magnet Forensics all the way down to all the other tools? This is something that the only way to get access to this is that you have to manually get in here and get into the SQLite database and take a look at this. And we, you know, it's one of the things, it's like once you understand SQLite forensics a little bit, we show the core how to do it, you might need to go in and look at the DNA and be able to figure this stuff out. A lot of the commercial tools out there have not really shown a lot of the data yet at this point. So we, you know, have a lot of the stuff that we're going to take a look at. The other, my favorite section on the course, and a lot of people hate this section, but I, I love it because for many years, a lot of folks uh, that are out there, when you're doing um, forensics, didn't have access to event logs uh, because they didn't exist on Windows XP. And so as a result, no one ever started looking at event logs. But on almost every single type of scenario, from time manipulation, tracking USB devices, for seeing people log in on log screensavers, you know, the, to prove the SOTI argument, the some other dude did it argument, um, you might need to really dive into the event log analysis. And we've really done an extraordinary job of trying to keep this section up to date with the latest uh, uh, evolutions of Windows. And you know, with the latest process tracking you're able to do and command line history tracking and more things you're able to do, that uh, event log analysis is becoming even more relevant to digital forensic investigations today. And the reason I like teaching this section is almost out of every section I teach to forensic examiners, this is the one that they know the least about. Uh, I have the least amount of people in the, uh, sitting in the classroom that know anything about this uh, while they go through it. So, um, so overall, when we end up taking a look at this, I want to uh, you know stop here, uh, and be able to answer just a few questions. We go go through this, but this is just a snapshot of some of the things that I'm like, man, I really want to talk about this, and I'm just you know we just run out of time about how many things are brand new in a Windows Forensic Analysis class, 
And you know, we update this thing multiple times per year. Every single time we update it, we're really struggling with, well, you know, how do we get more stuff into the class and what do we have to take out in order to keep this thing as relevant as possible? Windows has not stopped uh, its release schedule for Windows 10, and we're not going to Windows 11 anytime soon. It's just Windows 10 Creators Edition just came out, and of course we had Anniversary Edition and all these other editions, but slight variations of the Windows artifacts are slowly being released, and we need you know, additional research and development that's going to come out, and we're going to include it in the class as soon as possible. There's a ton of new forensic artifacts that a lot of the tools out there just don't parse yet. And you need to know that they exist because it could be relevant to your cases to be able to tell uh, you know, how many bytes sent from a specific process is potentially critical to intellectual property theft cases uh, via strong analysis. New tools and capabilities, we're really looking at the best of breed capabilities for both commercial and open source free. And then finally, and this is the most fun for us, is that we like creating a bunch of new data sets uh, that are out there uh, that we could use in the overall class. So, I hope at some point you're able to take, uh, come and uh, take the class with me, uh, but I want to open up uh, for just a few questions uh, before we are going to end uh, the section here. And I will uh, start with the first one here, and this is from Mike Diedrich. If I've taken 408 on demand, would the 50% discount apply if I attend the 500 course live in the classroom? Um, I, well, Mike, I believe it does. It's alumni in any uh, form that you've taken it in, as long as it was, you know, I think, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's the case. You have to it, go contact the registration and say, hey, listen, I took it in 408 and on demand. Uh, here's when I took it, you know, your you know, receipt or whatever. They'll be able to have that history in there and be able, be, able, be able to say, I'd like to take 500 in the classroom. Can I get the alumni discount? Um, so, and again, I think that's the way it works. Uh, but again, uh, you know, this, it should be any format that you've taken the class in. Um, where can we download the poster? Um, the poster, uh, or Carol has already answered that question, is under Digital Forensics uh, Community Sans Cheat Sheets. On the earlier side of the PDF, I also included a bit.ly link for it, and I believe it's dfir.to slash for500-poster, all in caps, uh, is another location you could do, uh, do that. And uh, finally, what's happening with SIFT and SIFT salt stack? Um, SIFT is a, a 508 tool um, that we're using. Uh, we have the Windows SIFT in this class, which is you get a full Windows Enterprise license with the class, and you also get a, all the tools installed on a Windows system. With the uh, Ubuntu version of the SIFT, uh, we're currently moving toward um, a 1604 version, and we've rewritten everything into Salt Stack to be much better management for being able to do the installation. Um, I should probably, once we get that thing uh, completely stable, which we're really close to at this point, uh, we're probably going to do a webcast on the, what the latest in this, uh, latest stiff, stiff stuff is that's out there. Um, any other questions here before we run out of time? Oh, perfect. How has the adversaries uh, changed their tactics and how has 408500 adapted? Well, you know, that's a really good question because you know, when we start looking at the different adversaries from hackers that are out there and um, more, we always hear about things like fileless malware, you know, this is a big one. Everyone's, you know, executing things through PowerShell scripts and, and more. But again, it's like there's no such thing as a forensic-less interaction with the system. And one of the things that we really try to emphasize is even if you're dealing with an advanced actor, um, they're going to have to execute something. If you're going to execute a PowerShell script, PowerShell must be executed. If you're executing WMIC, WMI must be executed. So it's trying to understand how to potentially peel the veil back instead of just focusing on looking for the malware of the adversary, you're looking for where they left the breadcrumbs and the footprints in the snow that the adversary existed on the system. In the instances where the adversary is trying to do um, actions on objective during a part of the kill chain, they are specifically looking at files, opening up files, traversing directories, opening up and executing things, doing file keyword searches, all of these things produce different artifacts, and it's completely difficult for them to completely remove their footprints from those comp uh, out of the system. And we talk about anti-forensics in the class, for example, how do you wipe a registry key? You could delete it, you know, and we are able to still recover that, but a registry is a database, and we could recover things from a database. How do you remove that entry from a database? Um, it's, it's not impossible, but it's difficult. And you know you can't do it without a third-party tool. And then how do you anti-forensicate that third-party tool? So there's a lot of different things out there that you know that once you get a you know breadcrumb that you're gnawing on, 
that you start being able to piece together what the adversary is doing on the system without just focusing on the malware or the IOCs. Uh, that's a really good question. Um, next question, and this is from uh, Preston Coleman. Uh, oh, by the way, hi, John. Uh, that's a really good question, by the way. I uh, just saw your name. Uh, Preston Coleman, is it possible to get a list of tools to be used in the class if we'd like to work with them ahead of time, similar to pre-configure uh, ones, uh, machine for 518? Um, yes. Uh, in fact, let me see if I actually have my uh, Dropbox up and running here, because I think I have it in the Dropbox. I'll paste a link in here. Uh, thought I had it. Yep, here it is. Okay, I'm going to paste a link from into the window here, I hope. So there's a Dropbox link uh, that contains currently all the tools. It may not be completely up to date, uh, but this is Dropbox link uh, to download the current uh, tool list that's inside uh, the Windows SIFT workstation. Oh, that was wrong window. Here, make sure I get the right window here. All right, there you go. And uh, Carol, if you can make sure that's sent out to uh, everyone in the chat window if I was not able to do that correctly. So All right, I think we're out of time. Oh, um, I'm not really able to copy and paste that from where you put it in, in the questions window. If you could just send it to all in the chat window, that would be perfect. Oh, that's where I'll do that. Okay, chat window, paste, all. Oh, okay, I think I did it. Did that work? Yes, that's perfect. Thank okay. You. Any other final questions? Or Carol, did anyone write in the chat window or what should be a question and so forth or anything else I missed? You got them all. Awesome. Everyone, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you attending today. I hope you have a great uh, weekend. Thanks. Thank you and see you at the next SANS event. All right. Well, thank you so much, Rob, for your great presentation, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.